Hello, welcome to another Black Horizons program. I'm your host, Hamid Rashid. We're glad that you could take time out to join us for today's program. I have joining me in the studio today two very special guests in the persons of Michael and Byron Robinson. They're just back from uh, Toronto, and we're glad to have both of you joining us on the Black Horizons uh, Thank program. You. Pleasure to be here. I see, uh, Byron, that uh, you must have acquired a new uh, wardrobe yeah, while sure, you were. Yeah, yeah, sure, you know, you know. Actually, he got the wardrobe before we went to Toronto. Yeah. Actually, yeah, it was his last day. It was kind of a going away present from somebody. Right. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm especially delighted to have you on the program. We almost uh, didn't, uh, we almost had an aborted program today. Uh, Byron, I must uh, commend you for your cool. I, I realize you got a little upset <laughs> when the uh, producer yes, referred you. to the dummy thank in you. the box. I'm uh, glad you uh, pointed that out because I was going to do it myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, what happened? <laughs> well, the Byron took a little bit of exception. Uh, the fellow, the producer, was saying, "Are we going to have that uh, fellow with the the little dummy in the box?" And uh, oh, oh, oh. and uh, so for a while, they took, they took me some yeah. time to convince Byron that he should uh, uh, appear on the uh, on the program. I see. Yeah, trying because I was going to do it, you know. <laughs> no shit. Well, Byron, tell me, how did you uh, how did you like Toronto? You're in the oh, big city. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, well, he he liked it. I didn't like it all that much. Probably because it was too different, was too much of a change. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But I, he liked it. I didn't. Right. Yeah. So you were he a little. He liked it. Uh, Michael, you were a little bit uh, disappointed with uh, with Toronto. Yeah, I it remember. was nothing what I expected it to be. Yeah. Like this, it's so very fast up there. Like I had guys sending me to Oshawa for bookings and stuff, and I didn't even know how to get there. And uh, you had to get there on your own, I guess. So uh, I dragged him around Toronto to quite a few places. We got lost on the subways many a times. Right. So you, like, you don't you don't drive, do you? No, I don't drive. I don't even have my beginners. Right. I don't know the first thing about driving. Right. Right. So, so it was hard. You have to have somebody behind you, somebody that can show you around and take you to these places. Whereas it was just me, right? I didn't have, I didn't know anybody. So I said I'll wait till I get a little bit more money when I can afford to do all this traveling back and forth mm -hmm. and when I make a couple of contacts. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans now? You're you're back in Nova Scotia for good? Uh, for uh, well, no, not really. We might go to the uh, states. We used we were at Yuck Yucks couple of times up in Toronto and a lot of comedians there that I was talking to said that they were going to the States. So uh, we might try that. I'm making a couple of uh, connections in Los Angeles and you know, we're going to make as much exposure as we can get. And if things work out, we might hit there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But well, you the know, something to do. <laughs> but for the time being, I guess you're, you'll be in Nova Scotia for, oh, yeah. for a while. Yeah. Right. Come down for Christmas anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder, have you learned any new tricks since the last time we talked to you? I wonder if I could perhaps have you... Uh, uh, Carry out some of your uh, some of your yeah. sleight of hand for so, us. Yeah, yeah. What about me? You got me out here for nothing. I got better things to do than come down here. I'll sing him a song. He's been writing songs lately. Oh, uh, has he? Yeah. Sing a song that you wrote. Okay. All life on the finally done. No honey, nothing. Us country boys that we can't hack. Early to rise, early in the sand. Thank God I'm the country boy. Oh, I got the old guitar, got the old fiddle, and the lights all dark and kinks on the griddle. Life ain't nothing but a thunder thunder riddle. Woo! Thank God on the country, Lord. <laughs> Byron, did you write that? It sounds awful familiar. Well, uh, not all of it. What part did you write? I want the thought that goes. <laughs> well, Byron, before we have Michael do some of his uh, car tricks, what about jokes? Did you pick up any jokes while oh, you were oh, traveling in your box on I got the... the uh, I got the best joke. Did you hear the one about the girl that went into this nightclub with this girl? I heard that joke. You, know, you can't say that sort of thing here. No, no, you, you just can't do it. Are you going to be good? Mm. Promise? Mm. All right. So you have to be strict with him at times. He's been hooking off school a lot lately, you know, so I can't let him get away with too much. Yeah. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> it is a good joke, though. I'll tell it to you later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let me see now, Byron. Uh, can we can we uh, move on to Michael now? Uh, now that you've had your opportunity for uh, to say a few words, sing a song, and uh, almost <laughs> tell a joke. Yeah, okay. I don't care what you do. I just put me back into my old dry, dusty, gin dingy suitcase. Uh, I don't care. It uh, doesn't bother me. <laughs> oh, Byron. I suppose we should uh, really, before you go, we, we should ask you about um, your appearance at the Iora Conference, this international oh, yeah, gathering in, in uh, July. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was something. Yeah? Mm -hmm. did, did anything exciting happen to you during the during that time? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a thing, no. Not, not that I can recollect, you know, but uh, it was an experience. <laughs> See, I got a new finish in the act. Oh? Yeah, actually, I'm going to walk off dragging this down to the high knee. 
<laughs> well, you haven't changed, Byron. You're still the rascal that you were the last time <laughs> we, we had you on the program. Maybe we'll have a chance to bring you back before uh, before yeah. we close off today's you program. See, you see you got a new Canada girl there, huh? Oh, you noticed yeah, that, yeah, did she's, you? Yeah, she's looking good, you know. <laughs> she's a nice lady. I kiss her, but I got no suction. <laughs> Byron, you're a rascal. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'll just take him back then and we'll get started then. All right. Okay, I'm just going to go over here now. You know, be careful, huh? But you've got rid of that rascal Byron. Uh, could you uh, uh, share some of your uh, some of your uh, tricks and sleight of hand with us? Uh, yeah, like uh, the, the one good thing that I did like about Toronto was the fact that I got to hang around uh, a magic shop up there, right? And uh, that that was the most convenient thing. I spent a lot of time just sitting around doing magic, and practicing for hours. I met a couple of professionals, and you know, so like I think I could say the trip wasn't a you know there was some fun in it. You know, we did get something. But one guy was showing me. He gave me this, right? It's a uh, it's a purse. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, right? And uh, you use it for various routines. I generally do odd <laughs> things with it, like so. Now these are my creatures, okay? Yes. You can have a lot of fun with these. You want to examine one of those? Hold it up to the camera. Give it a close up. Oh yes. Those those are a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a lot of fun because you. Well, let me see. I'll show you what I mean. Okay. They're just like people. They can reproduce. I can put two in this hand, put one in my pocket. When I open my hand, I still have three. Oh. See that? Yeah. Take these two, <laughs> put them in my hand, place this one in my pocket, open this hand, and I still have three. Would you like to try it? No, I don't. Here, hold your hand up. Okay. Okay, you hold these two. All Give right. them a good squeeze. Yes. Squeeze them tight. Yes. How about this one in my pocket? Yes. Say please. Please. Open your hand. Whoop. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun with them. I can take one like this. Yeah. Grab these two. You hold these two. Okay. Give them a good squeeze. Yes. Say go. Go. Gone. That's a nice... Uh, that's nice a, effect, yeah. That's a quick little effect. Mm -hmm. Now, look, I also do, as you know, I do a lot of stuff with cards. Cards are my favorite part. Every magician has one favorite act that he enjoys doing the most. Mine just happened to be with cards. Okay, and I do uh, gambling demonstrations. Sometimes I just do tricks. Today I'm going to do a little bit of both, okay? Now, the first thing I'm going to proceed to do is the uh, old effect of cutting the aces. They say there's not a gambler in the world that wouldn't trade his right arm to be able to cut an ace, okay? That's a hard skill to acquire. There's four of them. Yes. Of course, every time you cut an ace, it gets harder and harder to cut the next one because there are fewer aces in the deck. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, I'm going to show you a dealing demonstration, okay? Because a lot of people think that gamblers, professional card sharps, use their sleeves, hide cards up their legs and their collars and all that. A good card sharp doesn't need to do any of that stuff. A good card sharp can take any normal deck of cards in any card game and cheat. Right? And no one will suspect it as long as he doesn't do it too much. Now, tell me, how many people would you like in this poker game? Oh, let's have three. Three, one, two, the ace of spades is three. Okay, now we'll take the ace of hearts. Give me a number for this book again. Uh, six. Six, one, two, three, four, five, and the ace of hearts Another ace. is six. Yep, now we come to the ace of clubs. I don't think uh, I'd want to come to your house to play poker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how many people would you like in this game? Let's try, uh, let's try five. This five, time. one, two, three, four, and the ace of clubs is five. Cards a little bit sticky. Now we'll just take the ace of diamonds and put it right there. How many people? Oh, just for the, the sake of it, let's say 10 this ten. time. 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the ace of diamonds is 10. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's your simple dealing demonstration. Now, I'm going to show you an effect known as the ambitious card trick, okay? It's generally, I do it with the ace of spades. What you're trying to do when you're doing this effect is prove to the audience how ambitious a card is. You see, the best place to be in the deck is at the top, okay? The top of the deck is the biggest spot. It's just like being the Prime Minister of Canada. Once a curry reaches the top, he looks down on his fellow brethren. Same with the Ace of Spades. I find that I can always bring the Ace of Spades to the top because it always comes there. If I were to place the Ace of Spades in the center of the deck, it would still come back to the top. Okay? That's the ambitious effect. I've tried everything. I've even tried cutting it into the deck like that. Mm -hmm. it, it just comes right back to the top, always face up. Right? Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to do a trick. Okay? That was a little bit of gambling. Make sure there's no more jokers in this deck. Do you gamble? No, I, I don't. Uh, oh, I was going to—I was going to ask if you wanted a little game, but <laughs> no, no. In fact, I—I I think uh, when we were discussing it last time, in all seriousness, you were telling me that that you don't gamble either. No, I don't gamble. No, it's—I've um, never gambled. Mm. I was tempted to gamble many times, you know, but I—I I generally don't gamble. We only have one joker, so we don't need that. Here's what I'm going to do, Mohammed. I want you to pick one of these cards. Alrighty. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Already. Take it out. Okay. Alrighty. Look at it. Show it to the monitors. Show it to the monitors? Yep. Show All it to right. the camera. Make yeah. sure I can't see. Can we get it on one of the cameras? I guess we probably probably got it. Okay. Got it. Okay. What I'm going to ask you to do is keep the card there. Yes. So let anybody have a look at it. Do you think it's possible for me to look through this entire deck 
and memorize them like that and know which card you took out? Do you think that's possible? I suppose it's probably possible, but it's highly improbable. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Increase the odds. Place your card back into the deck. Yes. Okay, place it anywhere you like. Now I want to take the cards and give them a good shuffle. Just like that. Okay? I, I think I remembered what the give card a was. Of cuts. <laughs> <laughs> give them a couple of cuts there. Okay, now shuffle the cards. Shuffle the cards? Shuffle the cards. Shuffle I gotta them try up to remember the, the card here now. Okay, I'm not very good at shuffling. As you can see, I'm a long way from being a card chart. Yeah. <laughs> well, I generally do this one, right? This one here. But uh, I used to do this one. But everybody does that one, so I don't do it anymore. Okay. Do you believe that it would be almost impossible for me to find your card right now? Well, uh, you've done an awful lot of manipulation of those cards, so, so it you would seem that, that you, you would admit that these cards are fairly well shuffled. I think they have been, yes. Good, because we're not going to use this deck. You're not going to use okay. that deck. Well, if I can't find it, I can't find it, right? Right. So we'll just put that over here. I learned a trick by the Invisible Man. He yes. taught me this, okay? Here is my invisible deck of cards, all yes. right? What right. color is that deck? Uh, I can't see it. <laughs> well, if you use your imagination, you can see it. All right, let's say that it's, uh, let's say that it's, uh, it's blue. It's blue or red? Blue. No, it's not blue. It's red. You're not looking hard enough. All right, it's red. Okay, it's red. Now, I'm going to open up these cards, take them out of the case. Yes. I'm going to put them face up in my hand. Yes. And I'm going to go through them. Mm -hmm. When you see your card, mm -hmm. I want you to say stop. Right. Okay? Stop. Okay, take your card out of the deck. All righty, I have them. Okay, now. You want me to show them to the monitor? Yeah, show it to the monitor. Okay, there it is. Once again, for the slow readers. Have we put them on the monitor? <laughs> okay, Here's now. my card. Right, I'm going to take that card. I'm going to show you exactly how to do the trick. All right. I place your card here like that. Yes. Okay, the invisible card. I reach into my pocket and I take out my invisible wallet. Mm -hmm. The deck's here, the card's there. Now, what I'm going to do is while you're not looking, I use misdirection, I take your card and place it in the wallet, right? Of you can cover this up with idle chit chat. I generally say, my God, what nuclear power plant did you walk by when you're. You know, did your mother walk by? But anything like that to mix them up a little bit. <laughs> and you place the wallet in your pocket. Or say, hey, look over there. You know, look at that. You know, yeah. Slip it in there. So I yeah. take the wallet, yeah. right, with the card in it, and place them in my pocket. Yes. Okay? So I take the deck, place it in my pocket there, mm -hmm. snap my fingers, and everything that was invisible now becomes visible. Here we have the deck of cards. Okay? Mm -hmm. Do you remember your card? Yes. Okay, go through the deck and find your card okay. and bring it down and show it to us. Let's see now if I can locate this card in here. I think I was doing better with the invisible the invisible uh well that is the invisible deck it's just visible now well it doesn't seem you to took your card out of it I, I, I guess i must because it doesn't seem to be in here it doesn't seem to be in there it doesn't seem to be in here okay now watch closely okay i s my invisible wallet also turned visible i open up my vest there i have a wallet yes okay i take that out open it up we see that there is a card oh in yes. the wallet mm -hmm. okay now i'm going to have you Give you the liberty of turning the card over. This and card? Yeah, not yet. I'm going to build it up. Yes. <laughs> you could have picked any card that you wanted. Yes. Right? You have the card in mind. What is the name of your card? King of Hearts. King of Hearts. Turn that one over. Oh, King my of Hearts. goodness. So it is. And not only that, if you also look, you notice, <laughs> you notice that there is a piece of paper sticking out of the wallet. Yes. Right? Could you read this to us and tell us what it says? Okay. This is a note from Byron, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your card is the King of Hearts. Well, that's fantastic. The Invisible Man taught me that when I was up in Toronto. So this is one of the new tricks you yeah. learned in Toronto. That, <laughs> that is quite a trick. So not only did you pick the card, but you also had uh, the uh, had it predetermined. Yes, predetermined pretty much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any other? Well, that's. Well, I'll, sh I'll show you a quick one here. Your ball right. manipulations like that. All magicians do some few things with balls. Here's a quick one here. You just like that. The first time I tried that, it hurt. It did. That can be very painful. Mm -hmm. but it's just basically wooden balls. You can do the effect where you take it and place it in your pocket and it comes back to the top of your fist. You take it like that and place it in your pocket and it comes back to the fist. Then I'll hold it like this, give everybody a good view of it. Place it on the table, give it a little rub, and the old sponge ball comes out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, now, Michael, uh, you're back in Nova Scotia. I guess that means that you're, you're ready and willing and able to... Uh, and anxious, I suppose, to take some bookings if they come your way, eh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I came back, because at Christmas time you always have a pretty sizable amount of bookings, because there's a lot of parties going on and different groups getting together. Christmas is a holiday where people like to get together and have fun, so you generally don't have any trouble finding work around Christmas. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, I know in previous years you've done the Daddy Show. Are you, will you be doing the uh, Daddy Show this year? I'm going to try to get in touch with them. Uh, the trouble is I'm going to Truro Monday. November 6th, I'll be there I'm go leaving Sunday because on the 6th I have to do a talk at the school, eh? so I won't be able to come down for it. I hear that the deadline is November 8th, mm -hmm. so if I can get in touch with them before that and there's an opening or they feel that they could use the act, I'd be more than happy to do it. Right. 
what will you be talking? You'll be talking about your your um, skills when you talk to the children. Uh, or? No, no. Mostly, I'll be talking about the history of magic and the history of ventriloquism, and uh, the changes that they've gone through from the past up to the present time. Mm -hmm. Could you share some of that history uh, with our the viewers of our program? I know we touched on this last time, likely yeah. when we were uh, we had you on in the, in the summer before you went off to Toronto. But could you just mm -hmm. give us to some of our viewers a little uh, yeah, uh, we'll thumbnail uh, sketch? Yeah, we'll see. Ventriloquism and magic are very closely linked together. Right. Uh, the point of it is, like, right now, in today's present time, ventriloquism and magic are used to entertain people. Mm -hmm. However, back in prehistoric times, magic and ventriloquism, ventriloquism especially, was used to scare the wits out of people. The first priests, medicine men, leaders were probably magicians. They found uh, evidence of magic dating back before the time of Christ. Uh, for those who study ancient history, there was a man in Athens named Oracles. You heard of Athens. And... Um, Oracles supposedly was chosen by the gods to communicate to the people. And uh, Oracles was an excellent ventriloquist. So what he'd do is he'd get everybody in the town to come to the temple, and he'd go inside, have a sandwich, drink a beer, watch the game, whatever. You know, <laughs> just lounge around and yes. come back out and tell the people what the gods had said. You know, yes. and what he was doing really was he was ripping a lot of people off because he'd come out and say, well, folks, you know, uh, I was just in there talking to the gods, and uh, they're not too happy with y'all. And yeah. they, they said they're getting kind of low on change, and uh, if you guys don't bring all your worldly possessions and whatever, they're going to come down and hurt you. you know, if you, uh, may I direct your statue? You know, the statue over there will say the same thing, if I can direct your attention to it. And everybody would listen to the statue, and the statue would say the same thing. You know, and the people would, they'd believe it. They'd just be running home trying to get their valuables and their goods. And he made a fortune. Mm -hmm. He made a big fortune. And nobody ever really caught on to him. They say he was probably, technically wise, the best ventriloquist that ever lived. Because had he been caught, you know, he mm -hmm. probably would have been done in. Uh, there's been stories about guys who were, had their lives saved by making demons come out of pits or holes or caves mm -hmm. and scaring off the pursuers. Right. Stuff like that. Well, now, we hear a lot about this in, in, uh, in as you say, in mythology and, uh, and so on. And, and, and these magicians uh, were very uh, prominent uh, people. They exercised a lot of political influence on a lot of these earlier yes. uh, societies yeah. uh, by virtue of their, their skills and so on. I understand that the, the Egyptians were n noted for their, their ability. And yes, and matter of fact, the Egyptians invented one of the best sleight of hand effects of all time, which is still used today. It's called the cups and balls. It's just three cups and three ball balls. It has a basic plot. The balls move from one cup to the other. And um, they're experts at it. They invented it. Uh, the only change it's had today is that the cups are shaped more like cups, whereas their cups were round and had a little knob on them so that you could hold them between your hands like that. But they invented that trick, and that's an extremely old trick. It's over 3,000 years old. Mm -hmm. And so, like, uh, magic has a lot of ethnical backgrounds. All different groups, uh, Egyptians, the Chinese, you know, all different groups practice magic. All of them used it differently. But in early time, prehistoric man, it was generally used for a person to display that they had more power than the other people that they were with, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Well, uh, I, I, uh, is, is it an evolving field, uh, the magic? Is it an evolving field, or are what we're seeing really reworkings of, of tricks that have been around for as long as time, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, creating a magic trick is the same as writing a song. A lot of times, if someone will give me an idea for a trick, I can do it with no problem. Doing the trick is not the hard part. Finding the effect seems to be the hardest. It's like with a song. You have the notes, you know the notes and uh, the bars, the chords, but you just can't seem to put together a song. When someone gives you an idea, like they say, well, could you make it something like a card do this, or could you make a card end up here, or change places, or whatever? You know the moves and the slights, and you can put it all together. Right. But like uh, some magicians are innovators and some just copy, right? I create a lot of my own tricks. The one I just did with the uh, wall is my own creation. And mm -hmm. uh, the, a lot of close-up workers in the States are creating their own effects. But once you create a good effect, it generally ends up getting around to the other magicians because once they see the effect, they can put it together in their own way. Mm -hmm. So no one can really invent a trick and say that they invented it because most likely it was done at one other time. Right. Well, that was a nice effect. The effects are very important, and sometimes they're more important than the, the basic trick, as you say, yeah. itself. Like the one with the purse, for example, as you did earlier in the program, mm -hmm. was a, a nice little effect. You see the purse, yeah. you just see the gold coin. Of course, you don't see the purse, but the right. disappearing and so on of the, of the balls, and that's, uh, for a person like myself, is very difficult, but for a person yeah. like yourself, is a, a relatively routine kind of... Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's more or less simple. The presentation of it is the uh, part that you're most concerned with. Right. Well, now... The, the future for uh, magic, of course, the, uh, everybody loves a musician. 
But uh, what is it for the uh, ventriloquist uh, these days? Uh, you know, you, uh, is it still a booming business, or which which uh, which part of your act do you get the the most? I know you Byron is an integral part of your act, mm -hmm. but which part is most popular these days? Uh, I get the most response from Byron. Yeah. I generally start off with some sleight of hand, some mentalism. I do some magic, then I bring him out to close off the show, and uh, Byron is the main part of the act. He's the main attraction, and the people seem to go for that more than they did the magic. You'll get the odd ones that like to see the magic more, but generally it's comedy and it's mystifying at the same time, right? So people seem to like Byron a lot more. That's the most important part of the act. Mm -hmm. I just do this stuff here to really to fill up time. I you see. Know, and to give more variety to the act and uh, just to be a little bit different because magic is so different that eh? you can do different effects with different objects, eh? Yeah. Well, I'm surprised to hear that. I would have thought it would have been the opposite, that it would be the magic, that would, which would that, be... That's, be that's what I thought, but the people seem to be uh, more interested in the dummy. Yeah. Matter of fact, they don't pay any mind to me. Yes. I've talked to reporters and uh, magazine interviewers, and I just sit there with him on my lap, and they don't pay any mind to me. They'll ask me a question, then they'll ask him, then they'll ask me a question, then they'll talk to him for the rest of the uh, afternoon. They won't pay any mind to me whatsoever. Yeah. And they sit there and have a genuine conversation with it, you know. Yeah. You know how do you do? You know, talk to it and write everything out. And yes. They just don't pay any mind to me. It's, it's funny how much uh, influence that those things have. Yeah. So it's not hard to imagine why back in earlier times people could get away with fooling other yeah. people. Well, why do you think it is that there's such a fascination? I know myself. I, you know uh, beforehand, you know that you're talking to a piece of wood. You know that it's <laughs> not real. You know that it's not live. But yet you find yourself uh, being drawn into a conversation. Why do you think that is? What, what accounts for that kind of effect? I have... Uh, a very vague, very vague idea. I, I've heard people say that it's, it was all. That's right. Go ahead. I've heard people say that it's all a matter of uh, people fantasizing, being that people always wanted to read minds, and everybody has fantasies about being able to fly, you know, et cetera, et cetera, do all these things. And when they see that, it just takes them back to their childhood when they thought all these things possible, and here they are seeing it happen. And so, like, most of it is the challenge of it. You know, can it talk, you know, can this man, the magician, defy the laws of science, et cetera, et cetera. I don't understand myself really why people seem so intrigued by puppets of any sort. A lot of marriage counselors, when they're a man and his wife can't get along, they give them puppets, right? And mm -hmm. They battle them. I would feel stupid doing that, right? But some people, that's how they clear up the problems. It's the same with kids that have uh, problems in school or problems with society or juvenile delinquents. They let them use puppets to take out their frustrations. Mm -hmm. So it's... It's hard to explain. Right. Well, I'd like to go back for a minute and, and talk about, uh, about your career. How important is it to be around other professionals uh, to, to pick up new tricks? You've, you've shown a couple of excellent ones here that you uh, developed uh, as a result of your time spent in Toronto. Uh, how important is that to the growth of, a, uh, to, of your career? Oh, it's very important, especially if you're just starting out and you're only young. No matter what field you're in, it's always best if you could be around other people in that field who have more experience in it because experience is something that you can't buy. You're gonna have to get it or you're gonna have to learn it from somebody else. And when you're only uh, 19 or 20 years old and you've never had any experience and you've never met anybody in the same field as yourself, you don't really know what you're doing, who you're competing with, you know, what's going on in the world of magic. I found out there's conventions going on all over the place that I didn't know about, but the majority of them are in Toronto and over in the United States. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the big uh, professional magicians from the States are frequently coming over to, to uh, Toronto and Canada doing their acts, you know, stuff like that. Right. There's a lot going on. Well, now, uh, during the time that you were in Toronto, how, how, did, you, how did you stack up? How did you, f did, how did, you f did you, did you feel intimidated at all by some of the oh, professionals no, like, that you met? No, it was a lot of it was fun. Like, there was one guy, he was about 50 years old. I knew I didn't know half what he knew with cards. And he used to just sit there with about five of us around a table, and we used to all sit there with a deck of cards and just play for about six hours. I go there at 12, and at 6 o'clock, I go home. You know, different people would be coming in and we'd all be practicing, just having a good time, joking around. And uh, I think a lot of them were surprised at how much knowledge I had because I knew the names of certain cuts and different shuffles and, you know, all the different fancy moves. And I could do work with coins, cards, whereas a lot of people just stick with one basic thing. But they were in pretty much the same thing I were in. They did a lot of the other stuff, but the main interest was in cards. You didn't find that they were at all protective of, 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 their, of their skills? You didn't have a hard time breaking into their circles? At, at first I did. I had to cut the aces a couple of times, you know, then they started opening up towards me, right? Because they didn't know who I was. I'd never been in the area before, right? I just walked in and I asked if I could sit down and they <laughs> just looked at me, so I sat down and did a little bit of stuff and everything was So they developed a healthy respect yeah. and you think that helped you in terms of... Yeah, it did, yeah. 
Right. Well, now, uh, you talked about the pace uh, being fast, uh, but yet you're going off uh, possibly to the United States. Uh, certainly, the a big city like Las Vegas is on fire. Uh, That's true, but there's more opportunity there. See, the agents are a lot different from what I hear, right? Like, I was uh, calling some agents, and they were saying, well, we'd like to see your act. Uh, one guy wanted to book me at a stag. So we said, uh, get on this bus, get off at such and such a place, go on the subway, take three stops, go north, take three stops, get on this bus, the 17, go down that street, get on that subway, and blah, blah, blah. And I got lost about three times going to agents. Mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, I ended up going back home. Mm -hmm. So what they told me, they said, if you wanted to send us some promotional material, stuff from your photo albums and stuff like that, photocopy them, send them up, and you know, if you want to come up after Christmas, we'd see about handling the act because mm -hmm. they handle specialty acts like that. Right. You don't think that would be a problem in a, in a city the size of, of Las Vegas? Well, like uh, the way I'm, I'm working it now is I have an actress. I know a friend who's an actress, and she's over there, and it's going to work in TV people, right? That's, that's basically what the talk is. It's all about TV, whereas in Toronto I was talking about nightclubs. But what she's going to do is she's going to talk to some networks and try to get some plugs in. And um, I'm going to try to get some taping, send up some films or promo material, whatever. And if an act comes up, you know, or an opening, then I'll go up. If I have to, I'll go back to Toronto. I don't like fast-paced cities, but I'll still go there if it's a career move. Mm -hmm. But there's more opportunity in the States than there is in Toronto. So if I'm going to be in a fast city, I may as well be in one where I got a better opportunity. Right. So I say, you know, Los Angeles is one of the entertainment capitals of the world. So it might be wiser to go there than go to Toronto where I can't get around. Yeah. Well, just so people can put it in perspective, how tough is it for a young person like yourself to, to sort of break that inner circle? If you go to a place like Las Vegas and so on, how big of a break do you need in order to break into a circle like that? Uh, I don't really know because I haven't really had it yet, but they tell me that all you need is for one person to just watch the act or a, a good manager you know, that sees you and can get you into the top places. If you start off in the small clubs, you'll make money, but it will be, it'll take a little longer to get in. Some guys get in just like that, right? Like at Yuck Yucks. Some guys go in there on a Monday night and they're, they're off, like Howie Mandel. Mm -hmm. He started there. But uh, when I was there, I seen amateur comedians that were there on Monday nights that I thought were better than the professionals that weren't getting any work. So uh, I guess things are just getting kind of slow up there because mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of acts, a lot of agents are handling about 80 different singers and they don't really have time to look at a specialty act. Mm -hmm. So they just kind of shoo it off, not, no pay any mind to it. Right. So. The, the specialty act now, is it... Uh, it, 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 it isn't a priority then, I would, I would assume, among the other performing kinds of arts. It's not something that it's, it's as popular as some of the other kinds of things. Yeah, and yeah. it generally specializes in one particular field, like in art. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, magic is the type of thing that's like chess or music. You'd have to devote a lot of time to it, and you have to have an extreme amount of discipline for it. But uh, it's just one of those things that they have to find the right spot for it. Some people will take a chance and put a m comedian or a magician on before a band, where some guys won't even look at the act. I went to a lot of places, they wouldn't even look at the act. They said, no, we don't want nothing to do with that kind of act, you know. So uh, you gotta find the right places. You, right. Have to know, you have to know big people, that's the main thing. If you right. don't know big people, you're not gonna get to the big places. Right. Yeah. Well, Michael, it's always a pleasure to have you and Byron on the program. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to bring him back. He probably is yeah. getting fairly argumentative by this point, a bit hearing, us, a bit hearing us refer to him as, 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 the, as that piece of wood and the dummy and things of, of that kind, but I wanna wish you the best. Well, and we look much. forward to having you back maybe uh, in a, another couple of months. Thank okay. you for, for being our guest again. We want to thank you for watching The Black Horizons. We invite you back next week. Thank you for watching.
Hello, welcome to Black Horizons. I'm your host, Hamid Rashid. We're glad that you could take time out to join us for today's program. On Friday evening, November 12th, 1982, the Black Cultural Society of Nova Scotia sponsored a reunion and recognition night for the black veterans of World War I. This most fitting tribute to Canada's forgotten black soldiers was well attended by over 300 members of the black community from Nova Scotia in New Brunswick. In today's program, we'll bring you highlights of that very moving and historic evening. The outbreak of war in August 1914 created a tremendous upsurge of patriotism. Canadians rallying to uphold democracy flocked to recruiting stations and within a few months the first Canadian troops landed in England. Angered at the rejection of black volunteers, members of Canada's black community protested. Finally, the Department of Militia and Defence, in response to protests from black leaders concerning the rejection of black volunteers, authorized the formation of the Number 2 Construction Battalion on July 5, 1916, two full years after the outbreak of war. The battalion, at a strength of 18 white officers and 598 black enlisted men, sailed from Halifax, Nova Scotia on March 28, 1917. Last Friday's banquet was attended by nine of the estimated 21 surviving black veterans of the First World War. Advanced years and poor health prevented many of their comrades from attending this last hurrah. Gus Wedderburn, president of the Black Cultural Society, welcomed those present and explained the purpose behind the occasion. A famous Nova Scotian once said that for a people to be great, they must gather onto themselves the memorabilia of their past achievements, and they must honor their ancestors who have accomplished. And those things must be preserved for future generations and the cultural center or the cultural society tonight is trying to do just that. We are trying tonight to honor the men who fought to make Canada. And we're also here tonight to honor those men who died to make the country great. Would you say thanks, please? I thought I should show you something. Sitting two seats from me is Mr. John Wesley Seeley, and he proudly showed the minister and myself his birth certificate. I want to read that to you. Name of person, John Wesley Seeley, sex male. Date of birth, August 28, 1892. <laughs> I have here a cable, no, a release, is this a plane? From Ottawa, which reads, The Society for the Protection and Preservation of Black Culture in Nova Scotia has this year organized a special project to record and preserve the history of the involvement of black Canadians in World War I. It also hopes to heighten the awareness of the black community and the general public of the contributions of black in the development of Canada and to publicly recognize the historical significance of the involvement and achievements of black veterans who were members of the number two construction battalion. Black veterans joined their battalion from all parts of Canada. 18 surviving vet veterans have been located and are being brought to Halifax for a series of events to be held over the Remembrance Day weekend. Events include a reunion and reception for veterans, a tour of Halifax, including the original point of departure, audiovisual taping of the memories and history of the veterans presentation of citations and plaques at a public banquet and a church parade. 
This is a press release that is being put out by the Department of Multiculturalism. I wish to say thank you to the band, which was, a, was playing most appropriate music. And I want to thank you all for being here. And I want to invite you all to join the center. Ten bucks a year. We need it. Thank you. Thank you. A number of government officials and heads of organizations were in attendance and gave fitting greetings on behalf of their respective organizations. First, Canada's Secretary of State, Serge Joyel. My colleague, Minister of Social Affairs in the uh, Nova Scotia government, distinguished war veterans, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it's it's a real pleasure for me to be tonight, and in a sense, a privilege. A privilege because, in fact, if today we lived in a free and democratic Canada, it's because of the first time in our history that Canada has an opportunity to show her colors at the international level and at the national level to stand for freedom, Canadians from all communities, all origins, did stand up and show to other Canadians their fate in freedom. When we had that tremendous and difficult task in the last two years to establish the basis on which our country would have a future. We paid the deepest attention to our predecessors. Tonight, we have the most privileged opportunity to tell to those who have sacrificed their life and those who are with us tonight by the will of God that we believe in their sacrifice. And as new generation will come in Canada, they will have the same role, the same task to tell Canadians that freedoms has no color, freedom has no difference of languages. Freedom is essentially human dignity, and that's the message that the 18 veterans here tonight want to tell us. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it will be time to lift our glass and pay tribute to those men who have made Canada today. <laughs> To the war veterans, those who survive, those who have died, long future ahead. Dr. George McCurdy, Director of Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. On behalf of the, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission, uh, I am pleased to join with the, the countless friends of the, number, the veterans and survivors of number two battalion and this distinguished audience in paying fitting and worthwhile tribute to the survivors, the veterans of number two construction battalion of World War I. It is awfully important, Mr. Chairman, I think, uh, to put black history in its proper perspective. We must, I think, remind from time to time our fellow citizens and Nova Scotians that blacks have really helped to, to build this nation. We have fought uh, its wars. We have dreamed its dreams and we've contributed to its greatness and felt the weight of its failures as well. You, I think, the survivors and the veterans of number two battalion, in my judgment, you epitomize the real profiles of courage in black history. You fought, uh, gentlemen, for the ideals of freedom, justice, equality, and peace in spite of limited acceptance of black Canadians at that particular time. 
You have paid your dues, and I salute you. We salute you. Thank you. Representatives from various Legion groups. On behalf of the Dominion Command of the Army and Air Force Veterans, our President Ron Dunn of Montreal was unable to be here and due to bad communications. However, I'm given the honor to uh, bring you greetings. I might say that it was our honor just uh, on Monday night of this week to make two of the veterans that are at the head table honorary members of our organization. Comrades uh, Wilson, comrades uh, Jones. Jones. And I might say, on behalf of the Army and Air Force veterans in Nova Scotia, that we are prepared to make every First World War veteran a honorary member of our organization. <laughs> I would only ask that those who know where they are and who they are, would they try to communicate with me or with the provincial command secretary and let us know. We'll be glad to make contact with them. On behalf of the Army and Air Force Veterans Association, Ken, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, Mr. Rupp, for the work that you've done and communication we've had with you. Thank you again. I consider it a great privilege and a signal honor to bring greetings and salutations on such a momentous occasion as this evening. On behalf of all the Nova Scotian veterans of the Army, Navy, and Air Force veterans in Canada, to come here and break bread this evening is indeed a great, sincere pleasure. And to our WW1 veterans, I salute you on behalf of all our units in Nova Scotia. Thank you, sir. Clifford Skinner, representative of New Brunswick's black community. Uh, this is one of the most heartwarming occasions that I've ever had the pleasure to attend. And uh, I was appointed as a representative in New Brunswick to help out with this. And I went around selling tickets and talking to the mayor and so on. And you'd just be surprised the warmth and feeling that comes from New Brunswick. Of course, you people realize that uh, Nova Scotia wouldn't be here unless you were hooked on to New Brunswick. And <laughs> I just want to say it's a real pleasure. My heart is here in Nova Scotia. You see me as much as you see the Nova Scotians. That's right. And uh, when Mr. Richards was up here making a speech, we don't get too many chances to make speeches to a group like this, and we're very nervous and so on. And uh, I didn't want Mr. Richards to leave without saying that his mom and dad were here. And uh, we also brought Mr. Tyler. And uh, I came down in my car, and I had to come alone because uh, Mr. Tyler had me bring some medals and things. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, a, we have a panel that we're going to put out on the table. It's about half the size of the table that you have in front of you, and it's full of medals and trophies and pictures and so on. And it took two people to carry it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. W.P. Oliver, Honorary President of the Black Cultural Society, paid tribute to departed veterans. The number two construction battalion was organized on July the 5th, 1916. And according to the history that I was reading, it was organized to represent the colored citizens of Canada. And this meant that members came from Ontario, Nova Scotia, and Western Canada. But the great density came from Nova Scotia. Canada at that time was supposed to have had 20,000 blacks. And we're told that there were 700 males in Nova Scotia eligible to enlist. 200 of these men were employed in the mines. 500 were volunteers. That is 10% of our 7,000 population volunteered for overseas 
service. <clears throat> I don't know the number, exact number, who paid the supreme sacrifice and who are numbered with the thousands of their comrades who now lie in Flanders fields. However, I am sure that the remaining group with us tonight of that gallant and loyal 500 will remember them one by one and name by name. I have known and worked with so many of the First War veterans who returned to tell the story. And the one thing that has impressed me most was their willingness to enlist. They were volunteers, not conscripts. Many have told me how they added a few years to their age in order to enlist. What I'm trying to tell you is that many were mere boys, 13, 14, and 15 years of age. They served with distinction. They and their padre, Captain White, represented can Canadian blacks in a commendable manner. Edmund Morris, Minister of Social Services for Nova Scotia, the keynote speaker for the evening, provided a pleasant surprise by beginning his remarks with a personal gift to the Black Cultural Society. In the outer room, amid the muniments and mementos of black service, to Canada, to King, to Commonwealth, and to Liberty, there is against the far wall a particular corner given over to William Hall. William Hall was a simple son of the soil, born in 1827 at Horton Bluffs, He served in HMS Shannon. He was almost single-handedly responsible for the relief of Lucknow. And he held the empire's highest award, the Victoria Cross, the first Canadian to win the Victoria Cross and the first man of color, as it is inscribed on his sepulcher in front of the Hansfort Baptist Church. <coughs> when I come through Hansfort, I frequently stop and look at the small catafalque that now marks the place of William Hall. We should think of William Hall tonight in the company of these, his valiant brothers. What a source of pride it should be to you and to me as your brother that William Hall, a simple black boy from Horton Bluffs who sleeps forever in the soil of our beloved province, was the first black man to win the empire's highest award. So my mind tonight, in the few minutes I will be with you speaking, the hour is late, my mind goes out to William Hall. May I be permitted to say to you that with the consent of the board, I have determined, not being a man of private wealth, but a man of good intent, I have determined that I will 
to provide the initial contribution and it will thereafter be a private life charity to establish in the great new cultural center that is now rising a collection of books to memorialize black history and the black contribution to our beloved country. And I will establish <laughs> it will start with a few hundred volumes and I will build upon it, God willing. And my sons will do likewise after I am gone. I will establish the William Hall Memorial Collection as a, as a tribute. as a lasting memento of this great night and of the hospitality and affection the black brothers and sisters have given me throughout my life. An honest, sincere, and eloquent man, Morris, in the remarks which followed, paid fitting tribute to the black veterans of World War I and pulled no punches in setting the record straight. Come together to honor black veterans who served in World War I some in World War II. The Reverend Dr. Oliver has spoken so felicitously about the history of the Second Construction Battalion and how in the stormy Atlantic in early April 1917, 19 officers and 605 other ranks embarked for England and onward to France. It is a curiosity that, and an irony, and we should not now dwell upon it. Love has taken us beyond those years, but it is a fact that they were not wanted even in the white man's war. And yet the spirit that resided in them, the energy and the courage defined as grace under pressure, inspired them to serve on behalf of their people, their country, their monarch, believing that those things that they had inherited from the past would give way to a brighter day. So it's a, a final irony having volunteered and been, been told in many cases to wait, if we require you, we will let you know. Then they were sent overseas. In the very 10 days of the First World War that saw the heaviest submarine activity in the North Atlantic. Many of them must have wondered as they traverse the ocean, whether still another crucifix had been added to their blackness. But in England and onward to France they went. And indeed, they were accompanied by what is believed to be, and his daughter is with us tonight, sang so beautifully a short while ago, my buddy, whose great and remembered father was believed to have been the only black commissioned officer in British forces in World War I. So hear the names of those who survive now in their 80s, nine of them with us tonight, others not able to join, survivors of the great crusade that went to France. William Carter, Halifax, number two construction battalion. Jack Claiborne of Fredericton. James Cromwell of Southville, Digby County. David Albert de Leon, the first depot battalion, Halifax. A. Benjamin Elms, Trackety. William Guy, Aldershot, 
who served with the Nova Scotia Regiment, John Hamilton, who is with us tonight from Montreal, George Harrison, Montreal, Percy Howe, Fredericton, Malcolm Jarvis, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Sidney Jones, who is with us tonight, Toro and Halifax, served with the 106th Battalion, Royal Canadian Regiment, wounded at Passchendaele on the 30th of October, 1917. Serves on the board of deacons of Cornwallis Street Baptist Church, manager of the Age and Opportunity Center. Earl Leake of Fredericton, John Fanel, Fanel of Halifax, my dinner companion tonight, served in the Merchant Navy. Isaac Phillip, Phils of Dartmouth. Wallace Pleasant of Toronto. Percy Richards, who is with us tonight, from St. John. Robert Shepard, New Glasgow, John Smith of Middleton, Seymour Tyler, who is at my right hand, from Lakeville Corner, Sunbury County, New Brunswick, served with the number two construction battalion, as did many of the others. And then in 1939, went overseas in a second world war with the Carleton New York. <laughs> West of Montreal, Charles Wilson, who is with us tonight. Charles Wilson, typical of the other 20, enlisted, it is said, at the age of 17, deacon of the Cornwallis Street Baptist Church, president, former president of the Nova Scotia Association for the Advancement of Colored People. These are your valiant men, the 21 survivors whom we honor tonight. So tonight, in company with the Secretary of State of Canada, on behalf of the government of our province, on behalf of our 847,000 people, We ask in our own way to be forgiven for having overlooked, but at last to have had our eyes opened and to see more deeply than we have ever seen before with what valor and what brotherhood and what hope our black brothers helped to purchase our freedom. On behalf of a grateful province, I join with you tonight in paying our fondest and most affectionate tribute to the nine veterans who are here, who represent the 21 who have been located, who represent the hundreds who served and were not honored. On your behalf, and on behalf of a grateful province, to these veterans, brothers, whose blood is the same color as my blood, who were prepared to give it, who served and fought, and who lived and dwelled among us. The words of Mr. Valiant for Truth, inscribed around the edging of the great tabernacle in the memorial chamber in Ottawa. I am going to my fathers, and though with great difficulty I am got hither, yet now I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and my scars I carry with me to be a witness for me. 
that I have fought his battles who now will be my rewarder. When the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside, into which as he went he said, Death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper he said, Brave, where is thy victory? So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him upon the other side. Ring out, brave trumpets. Sing out, proud province. Honor, black men of valor, as they wait for the sounding of the trumpet upon the other side. And shall we at this time rise for a moment of silence? They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.